Good evening. I'm Ray Suarez, your host tonight. I want to welcome you all to a special evening. In view of that modest building where a few dozen Americans wrote the operator's manual, that brilliant document that gave us this magnificent country. Tonight, Eisenhower Fellowships honors and celebrates General Colin Powell as he steps away after 12 years as chairman of this remarkable organization. It's great to be back with so many Eisenhower Fellows again. A couple of years ago, as we were nearing the end of our most recent presidential election campaign, I met with a group of international fellows to talk about the campaign, the presidency, and American politics in general. I did not predict the outcome, if you're wondering. And if I had on that day a couple of years ago, I'm not sure anybody in the room would have believed me. Over the years, I've had the pleasure of interviewing General Powell and the vice chair of the fellows, Governor Christy Todd Whitman, in those tense days after the 9-11 terrorist attacks when we wondered whether and when New York, Lower Manhattan would be safe to work in again, as well as the new incoming chairman, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. And I quizzed our host this evening, Vice President Joe Biden, at a presidential candidate's debate in Des Moines that he had flown through an ice storm to attend. I didn't lay a finger on him, don't worry. So I was thrilled when my friend George DeLama, the president of the Eisenhower Fellowships, asked me to emcee this evening's event. It's good to be with you. We have an exciting program, and we'll even be making some news tonight. So let's get started. I'd like to welcome to the podium our host, the former Vice President of the United States, and someone who excites high school choristers, Joe Biden, Chairman of the National Constitution Center. Well, thank you very much. There, is, uh, there are certain things that are self-evident. One is I flew through the ice storm. I didn't get hurt in the ice storm, but I got hurt in a debate. <laughs> General, uh, I'm here for two reasons tonight. I, uh, I have the great honor of being the, the chair of the Constitution Center, and uh, um, I'm here because uh, two critical reasons. First, uh, some of you, not many, but may have watched the program Jay Leno's Garage. And uh, Jay Leno came to Colin and me separately and said, would we race one another? I have a 67 Corvette that my dad, who was uh, managed the dealership, wanted to give me he wanted a wedding gift he thought was critical. He could not afford one, but he could do the mortgage, the mortgage, the car payments. And he gave it to me, and I still have it. My sons had it rebuilt. Colin's sons bought him a brand new Corvette with 487 horsepower. And we went out to the Secret Service test track, and we had a drag race with Jay Leno filming everything. Now, I won't use the language, I'm from this area. I won't use the language they use in South Philly about what happened as a consequence of the race, but I, I got beat badly. And uh, we went head to head. As I said, uh, uh, he smoked me. But now, for the, for when I did my financial disclosure, and I think Bob Gates and I were kidding about this years ago, the Washington Post had a, a headline on the first page, and it's true, you can, as my wife, the professor, can say, you can Google it. It said it's probable, when I did my financial disclosure as vice president, 
So it's probable no man has ever assumed the office of vice president with fewer assets than Joe Biden. <laughs> now, I assume they weren't speaking intellectual assets, but they could have been. And uh, but now that I'm out, I can afford a new Corvette. So I want a rematch, Colin. I'm going to get that new Z06, and we'll get Leno and the Secret Service let us run again, OK? <laughs> but the second reason I'm here is that uh, it's much more important. I want to say thank you to the general. You know, uh, I, I personally think, and I'm not being solicitous, uh, the Eisenhowers have heard me say this before, I think the single most underestimated president in American history is Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, I think not just because he was a general and a great leader, I think that Colin Powell is cut from the same image as General slash President Eisenhower was. Your service to our country, Colin, in uniform and out, in government and out, has been an example and literally an inspiration to Americans of all backgrounds and of all political affiliations. You've shown us time again what it means to act honorably, to put your country before self and party, before everything, and we're indebted to you. Like President Eisenhower, you embody the ideal of both a military leader and a statesman. You are literally a warrior and a diplomat. And you continue to cultivate that legacy during your tenure and uh, of leading the Eisenhower Fellowships for 12 years. I think you understand better than almost anyone that peace and prosperity are best forged and maintained not by threats, but through communications and dialogue. The a superior military is necessary, but not sufficient to maintain our security and our world leadership. I would argue that America leads not only by the example of its power, but by the power of his example. I think that's the tone President Eisenhower set when he was in office and when he left. And I would argue that's why the vast majority of the world has repaired to us for so many years. I need not tell you, nor Bob Gates, who is a great, great Secretary of Defense, that uh, um, a lot of us in jeopardy right now, leading by the power of our example. And it seems to me that you understand uh, that uh, it's important to understand the perspective of other leaders and other nations. I know Bob's been there in the Situation Room when the President would turn to me and say, I know, Joe, I know, Joe, all politics is personal, particularly foreign policy. All politics is personal. You've got to have a sense of, quote, the other man, the other woman. You don't have to like them or dislike them, but you have a sense. Not a whole lot of leaders are prepared to appear in the second editions of Profiles and Courage. Sometimes you've got to find a way to enable them to do the right thing, or it's in the best interest for them as well as us, without losing face. I've watched you. I've watched how you do it. I know you believe that because a few years ago you wrote, and I'll quote, whether in work or in life, it's all about how we touch and how we're touched by the people we meet. How we touch and how we are touched by the people we meet. I've watched the touch, Colin. I've watched it connect. And I've watched it do it for decades. I know I don't look it, but I've been around a long time. <laughs> I've been around too damn long, but... But I've watched you, and you never cease to amaze me. I've watched you touch and connect with others for decades, and uh, it hasn't gone unnoticed by me or, quite frankly, anyone else who's paying any attention. You've always invested in people, whether it's in your command 
or in your leadership in a civilian role. Your leadership reflects that conviction, and that, of course, is why you have been such an effective leader for the Eisenhower Fellowships. Your 12 years of leading this organization spanned a period of rapid and incredible change for our country and the world. I would argue the last 15 or 20 years is one of the inflection points in modern history. I'm always quoting Irish poets, and my colleagues in the Senate thought I did it because I'm Irish. I don't do it for that reason. I do it because they're simply the best poets. <laughs> but Yeats, writing about his Ireland in a famous poem called Easter Sunday 1916, reflecting on how much Ireland was changing, said something that's more applicable today than I think it was in his Ireland in 1916. He said, all's changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty has been born. All has changed, changed utterly since the turn of this century. And whether it turns out to be terrible or beautiful, in my view, is within our power. But it requires your touch, Colin. Others have it, but not in the abundance that you've had. We're living in a time when technological advances have made it easier than ever to communicate and share information with people all around the world. But in some ways, it's made it much more difficult as well to meaningfully connect with one another. I did Harvard's class day last year, and I pointed out that they've got to be careful not to let networking become a verb. We've got to be careful. You've all got to be careful not letting network become a verb. It's also a time when we've begun to address the gaping disparities and opportunities afforded to groups that historically have been cut off from power. And under your leadership, Colin, the Eisenhower Fellowships have adapted to meet the new challenges, launching new groups that, for the first time, focus on cultivating women leaders, expanding opportunities for leaders in sub-Saharan Africa, and sending more promising young Americans, young American leaders, out, out there to experience other countries in addition to being what we've always done, leaders here, to understand our culture, our values, and who we are. You're leaving this organization in a strong position to continue to train and shape leaders who I believe will, in fact, not hyperbole, will, in fact, and they have, in fact, mold, mold our shared future and share with the rest of the world the value set that still defines us. You know, uh, there's a conservative columnist who I think is brilliant, who's written a lot lately about this. He said there's three ways. His name Brooks, David Brooks. He said there's three ways people have historically organized, by tribe, religion, and ideals, ideas. America is an idea, for God's sake. It's an idea. And you talk about it. You understand it. And you've communicated that to all these young, these young people. And so, in 2018, there's new leadership coming. Secretary Gates is assuming the mantle of leadership of the Eisenhower Fellowships. And I'm sure it's going to remain an important resource for generations of globally-minded women and men. In 2018, we have to understand how interconnected and interdependent the world has become. A trite phrase we use all the time, but it's more interconnected than we even fully understand. No country can completely wall itself off from the global impact of economic shocks, cyber threats, epidemics from disease, 
or catastrophic climate events. I watch Bob Gates. The reason Ebola has gotten under control in Africa is because Bob Gates and the Defense Department. We found ways to work together. We have to find more. We have to strengthen the habits of cooperation and make it easier to find and advance areas of commonality. That's why the Eisenhower Fellowships remain so important today. As important as when they were launched in 1953, they build, they reinforce our impulses toward mutual understanding. So thank you again, Colin, for your many decades of service to the nation and more to come, and for your many years of friendship to me personally. I don't want to ruin your reputation, <laughs> but I can say it now that we're both out. Every major decision we had, I'd pick up the phone and call you. For real. And you always gave me your candid, straightforward advice. And I cherished it. So thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone at the Eisenhower Fellowships for inviting me to be here tonight. And for all the work you do to make our world safer and more just. I had a grandpa who was an named Ambrose Finney from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And unlike most folks of his generation, he was uh, college educated as his father and grandfather were. And he was an All-American football player at Santa Clara in 1905. And every time I'd walk out of his house as a kid, he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother would yell, no, Joey. Spread it. Secretary Gates, spread the faith. Thank you all very much, and congratulations, Colin. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Now I'd like to introduce my longtime colleague and friend, the President of the Eisenhower Fellowships, George DeLama. Thank you, Ray. And thank you to Vice President Biden for his remarks and for hosting us here in his house. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight as we honor General Colin Powell for his 12 years of distinguished service as the Chairman of Eisenhower Fellowships. But first things first, you should all know General Powell didn't want us to do this. He didn't want us to invite anybody here. He didn't want any fuss. But as Governor Christy Todd Whitman, the vice chair of our board, put it when we started planning this, he doesn't get a say in this one. <laughs> so I'm sorry, General. Here we are. We invited a few friends, and the next thing you know, more than 400 people RSVP'd that they wanted to be here. Among them are 170 Eisenhower Fellows from 43 countries registered to travel to Philadelphia. To celebrate this extraordinary leader, we've had the privilege of following. They're joined tonight by our many distinguished guests and friends of Eisenhower Fellowships. We're honored to have with us tonight Sir John Swan, the longtime former Premier of Bermuda and a good friend of General Powell. Thank you for leaving your island paradise to be with us, Sir John. We're delighted to welcome our incoming chairman, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and Mrs. Gates. <laughs> Secretary Gates will formally take the reins of EF tomorrow at our annual meeting, but he and Mrs. Gates rearranged their busy schedules to be here tonight so they could join our celebration of General Powell. It's wonderful to have you both with us. We welcome Governor Whitman and Jim Hovey, the chair of our executive committee, and our dedicated board of trustees, eminent leaders who are so giving with their time and energy and financial support for our fellows and for this organization they love. I'd like to give a special thanks to our most generous supporters, the biggest contributors to our annual fund and our endowment. Let me mention just a few. Ellen Coleman, David Mankey, and Tim McBride of United Technologies Corporation. There's going to be a few, so you might hold your applause till the end. 
Jim and Carol Hovey, Happ and Marsha Wagner, Mark Greer and Prudential, the J.T. Tai Foundation, Jay Pryor and Chevron Corporation, John Keogh of Chubb, Kimball and Patricia Chen, Jim and Louise McCabe, Edgar and Ellie Coleman, Ambassadors Chuck and Sue Cobb, Jeffrey Singer, Matt Manders, Steve Paliuka, Pawan Singh and Bain Capital, Dory Friend, Ben Sarachi and the Exxon Foundation, Governor Whitman, Mohammed Alardi and Investcor, represented tonight by Rishi Kapoor, Halloran Philanthropies, Anin and Dini Bakri, Shahid Mahmood, and Christopher Fong, and Taiwan Health Tech Ventures. Now, please join me in thanking them all for their immense generosity. And tonight, I want to extend a special thank you to Mark Benioff and our partners at Salesforce, who are working closely with us to build a new database for Eisenhower Fellowships. I'm delighted to announce a $250,000 gift to Eisenhower Fellowships from Salesforce to honor General Powell, who is one of their board members. Half of this generous donation will go towards the Colin L. Powell Social Impact Fund that we are creating within our endowment to advance the work championed by the general with our fellows in Africa and in the areas of youth leadership and education. Mark couldn't be with us tonight, but he's represented here by Senior Vice President Rob Garzilli and his team from Salesforce, our presenting sponsor this evening. Please join me in thanking Mark and all our friends at Salesforce for their magnificent gift. I'd also like to take just a moment to recognize our other sponsors of tonight's dinner, our trustee in the Philippines, Jaime Augusto Sobel de Ayala, John and Lee Middleton, Harvey Chang and our fellows in Taiwan, Diane Melly and IBM, Michael Moen and Amarin, our 2016 Africa Fellows, and the sponsors of tonight's dessert reception, our trustee emeritus, Nathan Hayward, and his wife, Marilyn. We thank you all for your leadership and your commitment to Eisenhower Fellowships. It is because of your generous gifts that our fellows can go forth and engage this world with all their talent, energy, and passion. So let's please give another big hand to all of our wonderful supporters. We couldn't do what we do without you. We have so many other prominent people also with us tonight, far too many to mention them all by name, but let me welcome just a few. With us tonight is the 2014 recipient of the Eisenhower Medal of Leadership and Service, Dr. Mo Ibrahim. He, he traveled from London to be here tonight. Good to see you, Mo. From Taiwan, we have with us the mayor of New Taipei City, Eric Chu, an Eisenhower Fellow and the former chairman of the long-governing Kuomintang Party. I don't know for sure, but if I had a crystal ball, I'd say you might be reading about Eric pretty soon again in Taiwan's next presidential election. So welcome. <laughs> We're also joined this evening by two of my predecessors, former presidents of Eisenhower Fellowships, Dory Friend, who's also a trustee, a member of our executive committee. Dory, where are you? and Ambassador John Wolf, who had the privilege of working under General Powell for his first eight years as our chairman. Both Dory and John have been incredibly warm and generous to me with their thoughtful guidance and support. We, have, we welcome this evening our good friend Jim Haggerty, who's president of the Eisenhower Foundation, uh, one of our sister Eisenhower legacy organizations. Welcome, Jim. And also with us this evening is a special guest, the one with the longest and most direct connection to our namesake, President Dwight David Eisenhower. I'm referring to his granddaughter, our trustee, Susan Eisenhower. <laughs> Susan remembers her grandfather well and has a special place in her heart for this organization that bears his name. We'll be hearing from her a little bit later tonight. And there's so many other prominent guests here tonight, dear friends, old and new, you know who you are. But I would be seriously remiss if I didn't mention one other very special person, my beautiful wife, Carrie, my way better half. She flew in, she flew in from her film shoot with Netflix in Chicago 
to be with us these next couple of days. So thank you. All of us are gathered here to mark an important milestone in the history of our organization as we pay tribute to General Powell. I first had the privilege of meeting General Powell as a young correspondent covering the White House for the Chicago Tribune when he was the National Security Advisor to President Reagan. As the General has reminded me, I was a very young guy then, still in my 20s. But for the record, he was my fourth National Security Advisor that I covered in that White House. Um, when I first came to Eisenhower Fellowships in 2014, General Powell gave me a heads up that he was only going to keep doing this for another year or two, that he'd been chairman for a long time and it was just about time to go. And I thought to myself, okay, we'll see. And then one year became two, and two years became three, and then last year he said, I won't leave you all hanging, George. I'll be around for another year. So now it's been four years. Four years where I've had the great honor of being able to work with you, General, for which I will always be grateful. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Under General Powell's leadership, Eisenhower Fellowships has continuously evolved to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing world. Over the last 12 years, EF greatly expanded and strengthened its operations in Southeast Asia, welcoming Vietnam and Myanmar into our network. EF has intensified its work in the area of women's leadership, doubled the size of its USA program, and strengthened our network of fellows around the world. We have broadened and diversified our pool of candidates for the fellowship, deepened our work in the Middle East and South Asia, and in important fields of innovation, such as health, education, the environment, and the future of work. Under General Powell's watch, Eisenhower Fellows now commit to carrying out a concrete project with a real-world impact when they return to their countries, and they mentor younger leaders behind them. During his tenure in just the last couple years, Eisenhower Fellows have been received by heads of state from the White House to Sri Lanka to Chile to Pakistan, underscoring the global reach and influence of this organization we all cherish. General Powell leaves Eisenhower Fellowships with the organization hosting more fellows this year than ever before, in the strongest financial shape in its 65-year history, and armed with a new strategic vision poised for even greater things. These are all testaments to General Powell's inspirational leadership. On behalf of everyone at Eisenhower Fellowships, we thank you, General, for your service, your support, and your example. In 26, General Powell's time at Eisenhower Fellowships was marked by another notable achievement. In 2016, EF hosted the first regional program in the organization's history dedicated exclusively to eight nations in Sub-Saharan Africa. We had a record 800 candidates for the 24 slots in this program. That's like taking all the people in this room, doubling the number, and having them all want to sit at this table right here. That's how hungry young African leaders were for the transformational experience and connections that Eisenhower Fellowships can provide. Not surprisingly, the fellows ultimately selected for this groundbreaking program are all extraordinary leaders. And we have 10 of them here tonight who have traveled here from across Africa, along with Mo Ibrahim, who served as co-chair of our Africa Steering Committee and generously advised us at every step of the creation of this program. Mo and our Africa Fellows are joined by Mary Angawa, a fellow from Kenya who served on the Africa Steering Committee, and two good friends of EF who were instrumental in helping us organize the program from scratch in Ghana, Harry Kwao Jr. from Morgan Stanley in New York, and Evans Kwesi Mensa, the chair of our nominating committee in Ghana. Harry and Evans and all of the Africa Fellows have a special gift they would like to present to you, General, to thank you for your inspiration and your strong support for this historic program. So now I'd like to invite General Powell, Mo Ibrahim, Mary Ngawa, our 2016 Africa Fellows, and Harry and Evans to come up to the stage so that you can present your gift to the General. For those of you who can't see, 
It is a beautiful glass sculpture, and within the sculpture, the continent of Africa, with the names engraved of each and every one of the fellows in that program. For all the VIPs we have with us here tonight, and George introduced many of them, there are many more who could not be with us this evening, but wanted to send the general a special message of congratulations. Let me read the first one from a former chair of the Eisenhower Fellowships, President George H.W. Bush. Before I read President Bush's message, let's get into the Eisenhower Fellowships time machine and take a look at the future chairman and a future president of the Eisenhower Fellowships. Now, you're all laughing, but admit it. Back in 1990, you had a lot more hair, too. <laughs> this was back in another life before George became merely a recovering journalist. President Bush writes, Normally, these days, I'm known as 41. But as it relates to the Eisenhower Fellowships in 2018, this is six writing in support of my dear friend, Eight, who's done such a terrific job leading an organization that everyone gathered tonight respects and appreciates for the force for good it continues to be in the world. Put another way, I'm pleased to join you in saluting General Colin Powell as he lays down this, his latest mantle of high leadership. The truth is, in the long gray line of the U.S. Army, there have been few people of Colin's rare qualities ever to serve our country. As a warrior and as a statesman, he's contributed so much to preserve, protect, and defend this land and people he loves. I'm particularly mindful of Colin's thorough and able discharge of our plan to liberate Kuwait. He was steady, focused, and effective. Of course, during our administration, there were similarly just and important enterprises in Panama and Somalia. And through trials and tribulations of those, Colin was a rock as well. So it was no surprise to learn that he takes his leave of leading the fellowship, having contributed in important and new ways to its ongoing work. I'm thinking here of his work to help enhance programming and relations with China. Colin has a servant's heart, but so clearly does his alma. They've done and given so much to help others. Barbara was proud to call them friends, and you can bet I still am. Sincerely, George Bush. There are a few other people from General Powell's distinguished career who wanted to send him a message as well. Here are just a few. Good evening. Laura and I join you in honoring our friend Colin Powell. Colin, we admire your outstanding service to Eisenhower Fellowships and our country over the years. Your work to advance peace and defend American interests will pay dividends for decades to come both through your service to our military and government and through your work to educate and empower Eisenhower Fellows. Laura and I are proud to congratulate you tonight and to call you and Alma our friends. Congratulations, and may God bless you. Dear Colin, I'm so glad that I was asked to participate in the celebration of your 12 years as chairman of the Eisenhower Fellowships. The Eisenhower Fellowships themselves are such an important aspect of our country and our life and dedication. You, my dear friend, are the epitome of a public servant. You have defended our country abroad. You have spoken on behalf of our country to everybody. And what I treasure about you is your incredible interest in the next generation and your understanding of the importance of education and the wonderful diversity that makes America great. Congratulations, my dear friend. Colin, I'm very sorry I cannot be present to 
tonight to celebrate your 12 years as chairman of Eisenhower Fellowships. I've had the privilege, as well as usually the pleasure, to have worked with you in government on some of the most important issues in our nation's history. Your wise counsel and strong leadership have been critical to American presidents over many administrations. And for many years, we served together on the board of the trustees of Eisenhower Fellowships, an organization I greatly respect and admire for its mission and accomplishments. As your tenure at the Eisenhower Fellowships comes to an end, I join my former colleagues on the board, the Eisenhower Fellows, and friends of the organization in saluting you tonight. Thank you for your outstanding leadership and service in fostering the next generation of leaders in the United States and abroad. Throughout your career, you have developed and promoted the young leaders. There is no better legacy a person can leave. Thank you for all you have done, my friend. Good evening. I was in Chicago attending my son-in-law's birthday party. The chef came up to me whom I did not know, never heard of, and he asked me a question. We are honoring General Colin Powell in Philadelphia. Would you come to Philadelphia and be a part of that ceremony? Not knowing what I was getting myself into, I said, yes. Never did I dream what Colin had been doing to stitch together the world, to make it a better place, to bring understanding through fellowship, to share in the aspirations of the dreams of people from countries that are not so well off as others. I come from a small country, some 700 miles off the United States all by itself. But in some ways, I represent the linchpin between America and Britain. And I must tell you, which has not been mentioned, that Colin Powell was such a generous, committed individual to freedom, to respect, and the integrity of systems that brought those two nations together. So much so that he is the first black American to be made a knight. He is the knight commander of the Order of St. Bath. As a country, you do not recognize <coughs> that he would be General Sir Colin Powell. And the only thing he can do, which he's too humble to do, is to put the, the symbol behind KB, KCB, uh, Knight Commander of Bath, which is a military uh, order of Britain, a very high order of Britain. But instead, like everything else, when George Washington was asked, would you like to become the king of America? He said, no, just make me president. Colin Powell was asked, why don't you stand up and come forward to be president of the United States? He decided he was not ready to take on that task. But behind the scene, and as I stand and watch from overseas, and watch this nation define itself and present itself to the rest of the world, Colin, in many ways, quietly has been there. He's been there because the world has a great respect for him. When I found out that I was going to speak, I called a few of, my, few of my friends from around the world, from Africa, from China, from Australia, 
from Argentina, and I asked a simple question. What do you think about Colin Powell? I've got to give this speech. What do you think? What should I say about him? And they all said the same thing, almost like they had been talking to each other. He's a man we trust. He's a man that when he says something, we don't have to think about it because we know it's right. He's a man that symbolizes what good man should be like. I asked my executive assistant, whom, who has met Colin in Bermuda when he came to visit us on a couple of occasions, and she had another comment. She says she was surprised he was not the person that she expected to see. She said he was humble. When I touched his hands, they were soft. <laughs> he made me laugh. And more importantly, he just smelled good. <laughs> and so I'm not gonna say more than what has already been said, except he is my friend. He always has been from the time we met. We've shared a few laughs together. We belong to the Bohemian Club together. In fact, when the Bohemian Club asked me to write a reference for Colin, I, I was nervous because I said, what do you say about a General Colin Powell with all these luminates all around us? And I wrote them a very simple. I said, here's a man dedicated to his family, and more importantly, dedicated to his country and to the rest of the world. He does not separate one from the other. And therefore, with these credentials and these credentials alone, we would be honored if Colin Powell selects to join the Bohemian Club. It was the shortest letter I've ever written. Obviously, he got in, so it must have been the most effective letter I've ever written. Washington, as we watch it, as we see, is still the center of what's gonna to happen to the world. I am not an American. In fact, I'm surprised I'm here tonight. I still can't figure it out. But I can tell you, the rest of the world watches and waits for the decisions that are made that will affect how we sleep, how we work, how we eat, and how we feel a sense of security. There is no other force capable of doing that. And so the fellows of the Eisenhower Fellowship play a very important part in that process of going out into the world and sharing what democracy and freedom and the rights of people should be all about. It was enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. It has been in practice for many, many years. And we must not forget that those who are less deprived, those who have less, need at least to feel that there is a caring, sharing heart that reaches out to them. And the fellowship and its programs, as I have now studied, do that. So therefore, I'm honored on behalf of not just my little country, but to the rest, for the rest of the world, for people who would never, ever be able to put a face here. But when they hear about this organization, their hearts are here. So I thank you for this magnificent opportunity to be with you. And God bless Colin. God bless the work that he will continue because his journey has not finished. We should all call upon him because he is such a special individual. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Colin, you have been a friend and inspiration to me for your public service and for your extraordinary ability to bring a human dimension to everything you undertake. This has been especially important as you're the chairman of the Eisenhower Fellows, the, because the attempt 
to bring together a group of the ablest people from around the world at a formative stage of their careers and give them an exposure to America has made a great difference in the lives of the fellows and in the future of their nation. As president of the organization, you have done your usual superb administrative job and you have lifted it up to a new dimension in new parts of the world, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, Colin, it is an honor to be here tonight. And I only want to warn the audience that in every public occasion, Colin remembers some absurd event in which I was involved. And he's usually telling the truth. All the best to you. I'm delighted to join you in honoring my friend Colin Powell for his terrific service over 12 years for the Eisenhower Fellowships. Colin is the quintessential public servant. A child of Jamaican immigrants, he is the quintessential American story. Colin has served in just about every important position uh, that our country has needed uh, him in. He's been, of course, Secretary of State and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he's just been uh, an exemplary public servant. But the Colin Powell that uh, I also know is the Colin Powell who cares so deeply about the next generation, about developing those leaders who will carry our country forward through good times and through bad. He, of course, uh, has founded the Powell School at City University of New York to teach our young people about global leadership and about civic leadership. And I want to tell you that I know personally how important it is to Colin Powell to help bring along the next generation because I first met him when I was a young faculty member at Stanford serving on a one-year fellowship in Washington. I was actually serving in the Pentagon for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and this legend, Colin Powell, who was Deputy National Security Advisor and then National Security Advisor, actually called me and said, I'd like to get to know you. What a wonderful act of mentorship. And Colin continues to act as a mentor and as a role model to the next generation. Thank you very much for honoring my friend, Colin Powell. And Colin, thank you for everything you've done for our country. Hey there, Colin. I'm going to follow one of your golden rules and keep it simple. But first, I want to mention something that I think a lot of people have gotten wrong for way too long. You don't resemble Denzel Washington at all. The older you get, the more you look like Henry Kissinger. Colin, it's a truism to say that your service to our nation has been exemplary. As the finest military leader of your time, you orchestrated Operation Desert Storm, a textbook example of the right way to fight a war and the most successful battle plan since World War II. As a thoughtful diplomat, you helped guide our country through the tough times following the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington. And now as an elder statesman, your wisdom and sage advice continued to steer the next generation of leaders in America and across the globe. And so I want to congratulate you on your historic tenure as board chairman of Eisenhower Fellows. Through your deep commitment to democratic values and freedom, you have helped fulfill Ike's vision of establishing a global network of dynamic change agents committed to creating a more peaceful, and prosperous planet. Quite simply, the world is a better place because you walked upon it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I guess I have to call you General Sir. No, I'd rather call you friend. And, you know, the problem with coming at the end like this is that everybody said everything you can say about it, except you can never say everything. And that's the key. Colin, I hope you feel 
the love in this room, the number of people that are here because of you, because of the difference that you have made in their lives, because of the fact that you have provided the kind of role model that we want for all Eisenhower Fellows. And while we are privileged to have an extraordinary person coming to, in your footsteps, uh, no one will ever fully replace you. I'm sorry, Secretary Gates, it's just the fact. <laughs> you will chart your own path, and we will have something similar with you, I'm sure, at the end of your tenure. But after 12 years of expanding the program the way you have, the 2010 and 2015 all-women program, because we were trying to redress the balance of, of women participants as, as fellows, The Sub-Sahara Africa program, the doubling the number of USA fellows with the Xinjiang program in China, all those things are because of your leadership, as well as, of course, your steady hand when we moved from President John Wolfe to President George DeLama. All of that time, you showed us what leadership is all about. And so because of your extraordinary leadership, because of your dedication to this organization, and because once you're involved with Eisenhower Fellowships, you are always involved with Eisenhower Fellowships. You can't forget that. The Executive Committee is honored to give you the title of Chairman Emeritus. So congratulations and thank you, Colin. I have a duty. It is now my pleasure to introduce our incoming Chairman of the Board, Secretary Robert Gates. Colin and I first began working together more than 35 years ago, early in the Reagan administration, when he was senior military assistant to the Secretary of Defense, <clears throat> and I was CIA's deputy director for analysis. On several occasions then and later, we quietly colluded to sabotage weird schemes emanating from the National Security Council staff at the White House, for military and covert operations that made no sense to us or to our bosses. And that was the beginning of a very long friendship. In 1987, when I was acting director of Central Intelligence and Colin was deputy national security advisor, I invited him to speak at CIA as part of our observance of Black History Month. And Colin spoke about the history of African Americans in the U.S. military. And frankly, the first part of his speech was pretty unremarkable. <laughs> but when he got to the point in that history where he joined the Army, he departed from his text to speak from his heart about his own experiences, and he became electrifying. You could have heard a pin drop as he recounted the challenges facing a young black officer from the Bronx stationed in Alabama, and of the family trips to and from his home and his duty station. More than 30 years later, I remember him talking about making that trip through states where at that time few restaurants and motels served African Americans even in uniform. He described with a slight smile how for the trip in those days, black families needed a basket of homemade food and a friend in the Carolinas. As Colin spoke that day about the opportunities the Army had given him and his love for America, that hard-bitten audience of CIA professionals, spies, and analysts was moved to tears. And when he finished, the audience went wild, a foot stamping, standing on chairs, whistling, cheering, standing ovation. Later that day, <clears throat> I sent him a note 
February 1987, saying that I not, had no idea what the future held for either of us, but if he ever read, ran for president, he'd have my vote. As a military officer, like President Eisenhower, Colin always sought non-military solutions to problems, regarding force always as a last resort. He believed in the power of personal relationships and connections in finding solutions, fundamental and core to the Eisenhower Fellowships. I've always wished that Colin had been elected president, and I believe he would have been a great one. A president in the style of another Army general, Dwight D. Eisenhower. He would have been a great president because, like Eisenhower, he was and is a great leader. He has always made people want to follow him, and that is the essence of moral authority. Tonight, we honor Colin's long service as chairman of the Eisenhower Fellowships. When, as the new ambassador to France, Thomas Jefferson presented his credentials to Louis XVI, the king noted that Jefferson was replacing Benjamin Franklin. And Jefferson replied, no, sire, I succeed, Dr. Franklin. No one can replace him. I am honored to succeed Colin as chairman. I am honored to succeed Colin as chairman of the Eisenhower Fellowships, but no one can replace him. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Secretary Gates. Uh, for the last several months, we've been wondering what gift can we give a man like General Powell for everything he's done for us? What would be appropriate to mark his legacy? How could we ever let him know how much he has meant to everyone at EF? Then on New Year's Day, at a reception at the Independence Foundation with our new trustee, Susan Sherman, Carrie and I saw Jane Golden, and it all clicked. For those of you who don't know Jane, she is an amazing artist and a fabulous leader who runs the city of Philadelphia's renowned mural arts program. And tonight, Jane and the students at Olney Charter High School here in Philadelphia, working with master mural artist Ernell Martinez, have a special gift they want to present to General Powell. Jane Golden. Jane, come on up and take the podium. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction, George. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. So, but before I begin, I would like our students and our teaching artists and our artists to please come forward. Please make your way towards the stage. That would be great. Okay, here they are. So, I feel so honored that I am an Eisenhower Fellow. Um, hello, everybody. Come on up. Yay. <laughs> I'm like very enthusiastic. <laughs> I wake up full of enthusiasm every day. Okay, great. Okay. Here we are as a unit. <laughs> so during my fellowship in 2003, I experienced the murals of Northern Ireland, a place that was fertile ground for public art as political expression. The murals were pronounced symbols of political ideology and the division that was present. At first, when I presented the work of mural arts to the muralists of Derry and Belfast, many of whom had fought in the IRA, they said, Jane Golden, that's nice that you're doing this in Philadelphia, but this would never work in Northern Ireland. We're just really not that interested. So I never really gave up, because I'm tenacious. So we stayed in touch. And when I came back, I started to get calls. There was interest. 
I could feel it. Something was happening, something was percolating. Within a few short years, the skepticism that I experienced during my visit to Northern Ireland transformed. It transformed into a collaboration between students in Philadelphia and their peers in Dublin and in Belfast and Derry. Together, our students ended up working side by side on major mural projects here in Philadelphia and abroad. These two groups of young people were connected as if they had known each other for a lifetime but had not. We were able to see art shine a light on diversity, but within the context of commonality. We see all the time how art can challenge us and inspire us to think about the greater good, to listen to our better angels. Today, mural arts, while fiercely loyal to the city of Philadelphia, a city we love, we work with cities across the country and across the globe. And we are so deeply thankful to the Eisenhower Fellowships for planting seeds of knowledge and connection in us. Eisenhower Fellowships ask all of its fellows to engage, to inspire, to connect in a world that is increasingly fragmented and divided. I can think of nothing else more important today. At Mural Arts, we try to do the same. We try to create opportunities for connection through public art. Too often we see ourselves in terms of borders and divisions and boundaries, and we say change it and the magic of art can do that. We want to give people a voice to offer creative and organizational resources in their service. We want to transform how people see themselves and their connection to their community, to their neighborhood, and ultimately to the city we call home. What started out as a modest program in 1984, an anti-graffiti initiative where I worked exclusively with graffiti writers for many years. It has turned into a program that has created over 4,000 works of public art as broad and diverse as the 10,000 constituents we serve every year. It is truly inspiring. Thank you. And tonight, ta -da, tonight we are proud to present an important addition to our collection in Philadelphia, a new project created by young people in our art education program at the Olney Charter High School in collaboration with master muralist Ernel Martinez. There are thousands of students in our art education program and they begin with questions. They build collaborations. They investigate and they research. And they create. It is imperative that we provide our young leaders in training with role models to study and look up to. After all, it is not just about art, as important as that is. It's also about citizenship and civic engagement and challenging young people to make their mark on the world in big, bold, wonderful, inspiring ways. Every art education project we do plants seeds of possibility for young people that they will become our city's next generation of thought leaders and change agents. We want our young people to study our leaders. And I don't know of anyone who is a more inspiring role model than General Colin Powell. He is bold and he is determined. He is selfless and he is fearless. He found his calling in the military and he spent his entire adult life in service of our country. Our students studied the general's life, his career, his writings on leadership. They studied his example in order to create this work of art. They took this really seriously. We are so honored that we could join forces 
with the Eisenhower Fellowship to create this beautiful design that will be turned into a lasting tribute. Students will paint the mural this summer with Ernell Martinez and Mike Conroy, the wonderful teaching artist. And it will be installed, yay! Isn't it beautiful? Yes. And it will be installed at the Omni Charter High School where it will live on. And General Powell, you're invited back for the ribbon cutting ceremony, if I could be so bold to ask. <laughs> we want you back in Philly. Um, and there's some people I want to thank who made this possible. I want to thank the wonderful Susan Sherman and the Independence Foundation for their extraordinarily generous support. And I want to thank Cynthia Figueroa, who is our extraordinary commissioner of the Department of Human Services, who understands the role that art plays in young people's lives. Thank you, Cynthia. We could not have done this project without them and without the vision and belief of the Eisenhower Fellowship Program. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge Irina Perlstein from the Alney Charter School, my colleagues Phil Asbury and Julia Lopez from Art Education who believe in the potential that every young person has to make a difference in our world. Thank you so much. And Ernell Martinez, your artistry is incredible. And finally, I want you to know that this tribute to General Powell, like so many of the murals in our city, it will be alive, it will live on as a beacon, as a landmark, and as a continual source of inspiration and pride. We always say at Mural Arts that art ignites change, but it is really tapping into our common humanity that will make a difference in our world. And General Powell, there is no one, there is no one who walks the walk and sums this up better than you. Thank you so much for inspiring all of us. Please come forward. Um, we present this mural design to you. God, I can't believe I'm meeting you. <laughs> this is like so exciting. We present this mural designed to you as a way to honor your legacy and thank you for your service to Eisenhower and to our country. thank Jane and all the youngsters who are on stage. Uh, this really is greatly, deeply appreciated. I'm pleased to say that I have 12 schools named after me around the country. Uh, 11 are, wait a minute, wait a minute. 11 are elementary and middle schools, one is a college, and they mean a lot to me and I've been to all of them. Now, only is not one of my schools, but with this I hereby claim only as my 12th school. And I'll be there to visit you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Colin, George DeLama called me and said, would I come and introduce you before your remarks this evening? And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? Uh, so many people tonight have underscored the extraordinary uh, accomplishments that you have uh, demonstrated to the world, the critical roles you played at very important periods in American history. We have heard so many moving tributes to your personal qualities that I'd like to say in many ways everybody who's come before me has already introduced you. But let me just say a few things, if I might, um, about my grandfather, who has been going through my head all evening. Um, there are so many things I'd like to say about my own childhood. I have uh, extraordinary memories, I think, not only of him, but of observing him both in times of um, responsibility 
and in times of leisure. Uh, and I remember once as he was discussing with somebody an important event that took place in Europe, I remember thinking to myself, he really witnessed big history. Uh, to have seen his personal qualities in addition to later understanding more about his career uh, has been an extraordinary thing for me. And so, as you can imagine, uh, I take the stewardship of his legacy very seriously. As a matter of fact, I'd say that a big part of my life has been devoted to making sure that wherever his name is used, it's used in a worthy way to help other people <clears throat> to advance some cause. Uh, one of the, <laughs> you might be amused by this, but you remember he retired to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So once uh, we were driving through the battlefield, he, by the way, was a terrible driver. <clears throat> he uh, had had people driving him most of his life, so when he had to get a driver's license after his presidency, um, he got more tickets on Confederate Avenue than <clears throat> anybody before him. But we would pass General Lee and we'd pass uh, this uh, uh, Union or Confederate soldier, and he'd say, don't let them put me on a horse. Uh, <laughs> So he valued, I think above all else, um, the idea that an organization like this could touch so many lives. Colin, let me say to you what it means to my family. You have been the longest serving chairman of the Eisenhower Fellowships, but it's more than that. You've not only been a part of big history yourself, uh, you've brought those very personal uh, qualities uh, to your <clears throat> life and career, uh, that I often associate my grandfather with my grandfather. Um, you may not know this, but his 1915 um, West Point yearbook described him as big as life and twice as natural. And that, Colin Powell, also describes you. Let me just close. <laughs> Let me close by saying that I think you can never know really the great depth of gratitude my family has to you for your 12 years as chairman. We have been so gratified by the way you have taken his legacy and enlarged upon it. You have created uh, a greater recognition for this organization around the world and we are indebted to you. And so let me just say as my final thank you that nothing gives me greater pleasure than to now think of your legacy and his intertwined. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
of chairing this organization for the past 12 years. A lot has been said about what I did, and that's very moving, and I appreciate it very much. But I'm not the one who really did it. It's the people who work on the staff of the Eisenhower Fellowships. It's John Wolf, it's George, it's Christy, it's Jim Hovey. It's the brilliant staff that pull all this together and pulls the program together. And so I want to take this opportunity not just to thank you for rewarding me, but let's have a round of applause to the people who already really got a thing. And I want to thank Jane for this uh, wonderful presentation with the students of uh, that mural which will hang, and I can promise you I will visit it uh, as soon as I can in the very near future. There's so many other things I could say, but I want to pay tribute to the fellows who are here. You're the lifeblood, the DNA of the Eisenhower Fellowship Program. And one of the things that has make me, made me so proud of the ability to be the chairman and the honor of being chairman for these past 12 years is to watch how the program has grown, to see all the different pockets of the world that we're touching, to see how we're reaching out, but especially how we are creating an alumni association that has leveraged up what the Eisenhower Fellowship Program is doing. And you know, I'd like to say, you're not just an active fellow, alumni are active fellows, and that's the way it has to be so this program can, can keep growing. It is a dynamite program. I think President Eisenhower would be so proud of what has been done in his name over all these many, many years since his friend created the program right after he became President of the United States. I want to thank the fellows for what they do in coming and giving life to this program. I told Bob recently that the thing he will enjoy most is tomorrow afternoon when he meets with the fellows and has an opportunity to share his concepts of the world, what he sees going on in the world, his leadership techniques, the book he wrote, and what he has done to be such a successful person over these many years. I need to say that I'm proud of all of the members of the staff once again. And let me just take a little PS. There's somebody else here, Mrs. Peggy Safrino, my principal assistant who's been with me for 12 years uh, through all of this. She's been with me here for 12 years, but she's been with the Powell family for 25 years as my principal assistant. Thank you, Peggy. Um, next month, on June the 9th, will be the 60th anniversary of the day I was commissioned a second lieutenant of infantry in the United States Army. I'll never forget the day I got my Bachelor of Science degree, the JB4, but I didn't much care about that. Uh, it was the commission that I wanted. That's what I worked for. And as I received the commission and walked off stage and held it in front of me and looked down, and who was it signed by? Dwight David Eisenhower. That's who signed my commission as a lieutenant in the United States Army. We still have it and it has always meant something to me. Because as a young child, I got to know General Eisenhower during World War II. After World War II, as I went into my teen years, I got to know President Eisenhower, who the man who had to deal with the new Cold War that was emerging. And as I got a little bit older, I watched how he brought an end to the Korean War. And so my entire upbringing for the first 20 years of my life was associated with war, combat, and the challenges that faced our country. And it gave me the opportunity to watch this individual, this man they called Ike. And when he signed my commission, it said to me, I have to live up to the standards that he created. I have to be a good soldier, even if only a tenant, a lieutenant as he was as a general. I have to make sure that I meet the standards, meet the aspirations that he might have had for all of us. And I've worked very hard to do that, Susan. I could tell you, he's always in my mind. I just remember what he has done. I was reading it again this afternoon. Things that don't immediately come to everyone's mind. What he did on civil rights, 
the Civil Rights Act of 1957, and the second one a little bit later on. What he did when the people in Little Rock, Virginia, Arkansas, said, I will challenge the Supreme Court of the United States with respect to the integration of our schools, and Eisenhower did not blink. He sent the 101st Airborne Division, and we integrated those schools. We remember when Truman signed the executive order in 1948, eliminated segregation in the armed forces of the United States. It didn't happen right away. Six years later, we were finally desegregated, but only after Eisenhower came in and told everybody, I'm serious, get it done. And they got it done. This kind of person he was. And as I read about his career and as I followed his career, not only during the time he was president, but afterwards as he retired to Gettysburg and wrote his memoirs and whatnot. But I always tried to meet what he expected of all officers in the United States Army. I used to have, when I was a young lieutenant, and I'm telling you this is the truth, I used to have a nameplate that said Second Lieutenant Powell, and then it became First Lieutenant Powell. And on the back of it, I had taped a statement by President General Eisenhower. I've lost it over the years. I think it got lost when I moved from one place to another. And I can't quote it exactly, but it said something along the lines that always reminded me of uh, my responsibility to the soldiers and the others entrusted to my care. And that is that wisdom comes when the leaders speak to the followers, and between the followers and leaders, an understanding is created of mutual respect and trust. That was your grandfather. That's the essence of what good leadership is all about. And that's what I have tried to do in my time. You're getting not just another cabinet officer with not a lot to do. You're getting a great guy who you've heard him talk about some of the stories that we have shared over the years. I've known Bob for these 35 years. We've been through a lot of adventures together. We've had challenges, we have wars, we've had peace, we've had arms control agreements. We've had to control our principles from time to time, the people who we work for. Uh, one story Bob did not tell, which I thought he might, is that uh, in the fall of 1987, when we were signing the INF Treaty, and the Russians came to Washington, and uh, we invited them to dinner. And these were all KGB types. And Bob knew all of them. So I had to take them to dinner. And so I called Bob, who was out at the CIA, and I said, Bob, this is your lucky night. Guess who you're gonna meet? And I invited him to dinner, and we went to a restaurant right across the street from the old executive office building, me, Bob, and the deputy head of the KGB and several others. And uh, Bob thought he was really on top of all of this until the KGB guy looked across at Bob and said, are you still drinking that same brand of vodka and scotch that we know all about, you know? <laughs> they knew Bob as well as Bob knew them. <laughs> and that's what the Cold War was all about. But I'm telling you, in Bob, you are not just getting a successor, you're getting a replacement. You're getting someone who will make a great difference in the Eisenhower Fellowship Program. And I can attest to that by my knowledge and my experience with a dear friend, Bob. So Bob and Becky, I know you're gonna do the very, very best for this. I thank my good friend, Premier Swan, for being here. We're old buddies. I met the Premier when he was the Premier of Bermuda and I was National Security Advisor. He came to me with a terrible, terrible problem. There was a tax treaty that had to be passed, and the Senate was holding it up. And it was a desperate situation. The earlier treaty was about to expire. We had to have this done. And here I have a head of government here beating on me to get this done. And so I called a couple of senators who were holding things up, and we got it done. And I was able to tell this head of government that the problem is solved. It also cost me a lot of money to pay off the senator, but that's another story. <laughs> but what I will never forget is this head of a government left my office and went out onto West Executive Avenue and was hauling, hailing a cab. I said, my God, we've got a head of government out there looking for a cab. Can we get him a car? He wanted a cab. 
I hope you got home safely. I don't remember now. It was very good. There are so many other stories that I could share with you, but time is short. Let me just say that it's one of the greatest periods in my career and in my life to have been given this chance to be associated with this superb organization. An organization named after a remarkable individual who is not get anywhere near the credit he deserves for what he did as a leader of this country. He had, an, he had a temper. We all know that, don't we, Susan? But at the same time, in public, he was always that calm, determined man who seemed to know where to take the country and what to do. And he would always do that which he thought was right. He always did that which he thought was in the benefit of the United States of America and in the benefit of world peace. He talked about the military industrial complex and he warned us about that. He pulled the European nations out of the Sinai. He thought it was wrong when they invaded the Suez Canal on the end of the Sinai Peninsula. And he is just a model for all of us. And so to have my name associated with the Eisenhower Fellowship Program and to know that the program will continue under the leadership of somebody like Bob Gates and to know that all the people here will never forget what they owe the Eisenhower Fellowship Program. The African contingent that was up here earlier, all the other contingents that now reflect the program. Ike would be so proud. He'd be so happy at what this has become, but not as proud and happy as he might be 10 years from now as you continue to grow the different programs, as the alumni community continues to grow and link with the active duty, I will call them, members of the Eisenhower Fellowship Program. I cannot tell you how humbled and pleased I am to be here this evening. I cannot tell you how humbled and proud I am to have been given the opportunity to serve as the chairman of this organization for the last 12 years. And as they say in the Navy, may you always have fair winds and following seas as you continue down this path to making it an even better and bigger program. Thank you for coming out this evening. God bless you.